All right, grab your Bible and let's turn to the book of Matthew in the New Testament, the book of Matthew, and we'll pick it up from where we left off the last time that I was preaching. We've been going through the uh, book of Matthew verse by verse, and uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 23. Uh, I think it's good to remember again that uh, when we come to the Word of God, if what we do is just kind of find some place and say, I'm going to teach that or preach that, that's wonderful, but uh, it's not as good as coming to the Word of God and looking at it in its context and understanding the history and understanding the background and understanding what the Lord taught us before these verses and after these verses. Now, that's certainly true this morning when we come here to Matthew chapter 23. So, let me just take a minute and remind all of us, and this is not new. This is, if you've been here every Sunday, you remember that the Lord has been with the disciples. He's been with the multitude. Uh, This is during His earthly ministry. He's been performing miracles, and He's been training the disciples and preparing them because uh, after His departure, uh, it'll be their job to take the Word of God to the ends of the world. And so, uh, this is really like going to seminary. This is a time of study. And, uh, but also during this time, we find that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes have really become his enemy. Uh, they're opposed to him. They feel threatened by him. And so we find that happening in and out of uh, this as we've been walking through it. Now, in chapter number 23 today, what we're looking at is the last week before Jesus Christ uh, is on trial. It's the last week before he goes to the cross. So this is at the very end of his ministry. Now, I think even there it's important to pause and say, now, what's the significance of that? Uh, I think the significance would be this is an important message. This, the, we're going to look at two sermons that uh, Jesus is preaching here uh, during the last week before he goes to the cross. Now, that, that has to have some importance to it, doesn't it? That has to mean that we ought to perk up our ears and listen to it and, and, and really take note of it. Um, Brad, if you can, give me just a little bit more sound here. I feel like I'm pushing just a little bit. And so we find here that the, uh, 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 and these are two messages. The first little message, and we're not going to look at a lot of verses, but the first little message is a message that he is preaching to the multitude and also to the disciples. And he's getting them ready for the fact that he's leaving. The second little passage that we look at, he is preaching a message to those that are opposing him. He's preaching a little message to those that are giving him just a terrible time. And uh, in both of these cases, he's pulling no punches at all. In fact, uh, in both of these sections of Scripture, we find the Lord is... Uh, extremely uh, urgent. He is forceful. He is uh, irritated. He is strong. He is, he's just not beating around the bush at all. And so, it's good for us to come to a passage like this, I think, with that in mind. Now, I want to back up because we also need to always come to the Word of God and say, now, as we're studying this and learning what happened at that time, we want to also be constantly asking the question, how do we apply this to our life today? Uh, What are the takeaways that will help me when I leave this church this morning? And so, I I think it will help if I just take a few minutes and remind us of what we're going through right now. I, I would say that all of us in this room kind of feel like we're living in a culture of deception. We're living in a time where a couple times a day we hear something and we say to ourselves, what? Uh, What? That's not true. Uh, Where did that come from? Uh, I mean, um, uh, help me finish this sentence. Two plus two is what? Four. (laughs) What a smart group. All right, two plus two is four. Isn't that true? And if somebody comes along and and they say, you know, because of science and and because of all of the background I have in science, two plus two is really five. Uh, You and I say, 
Whoa, wait, wait a minute. No, no, that's not the way it works. Uh, if somebody comes along and they say, well, because of all my degrees that I have and my education, I just want you to know that two plus two is five. And, and we just say to ourselves, what is going on? How crazy is this? No, that's not true. No, that's not true. This is truth. Would you agree with me that, in fact, I think what happens is uh, every day my experience is something crazy is presented to us in our culture, and I think, no, that can't be true at all. And, and then I think, man, this is, uh, this is the worst it's ever been. And then I go to sleep and get up the next day, and it's worse. And the next day is even worse. And, and we're, we're living in an age where deception is just prevalent. You, you know, what is truth? I mean, two plus two is four. And we can change that. You say, well, yeah, but uh, this guy's a terrific sports athlete. Man, oh, man, has he ever won a lot of games. And, and he says two plus two is five. No. No, it's not. Uh, he, he, here's somebody, and, and they're extremely wealthy, and we follow their life, and we say, look at all the money they've made. Look at how successful they've been. Look at, I mean, they are brilliant. And, and, and they've told us now that two plus two is five. And, and we say, no, it can't be. That's not true. An age of deception. Now, Write this down. We won't take time to turn to it. But in, in the book of John, we realize that uh, Jesus himself reminded us that uh, uh, in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says the devil is a liar and he's a father of lies. So let's just pause there for a moment, guys, and, and get our arms around this. From the very beginning of time, what Satan has done is he has said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be a deceiver. Uh, I'm going to deceive everything. That is going to be my mode of operation. Absolutely everything I do is going to be a lie. It's going to be a deception. And so today, every morning when we get up and we say, boy, that's deceiving, we, we ought to just remind ourselves, yeah, that's because uh, this is not our final home. Uh, this is the place where Satan is a kingdom is is in charge of the prince of this kingdom right now, and, and everything he does, everything he touches, everything that he's involved with, uh, starts with deception and ends with deception. It is all deceptive, and God's people would agree with me. Amen, amen. Now, when we come here to this passage, and we think about where we are and what's going on in our day and time, uh, and in our culture, and in our country, and in our world. And we say, man, it has never, ever, ever been this deceptive before. This is the craziest the world has ever been. And I just want to suggest this to you, that if you do even a little study of the period of time that we're looking at right here during the life of Christ, and what's going on with Rome, and what's going on with, uh, uh, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it was worse then than it is today. Now, that being the case, let's build our thinking here. That being the case, what we ought to do is say to ourselves, well, if it was terrible then, if the deception was off the rails, uh, how did the Lord deal with it? And, we ought, and if that's the way the Lord dealt with it, that certainly ought to be the way we deal with it, right? I and mean, we can take some lessons there. And so what we find here is the Lord in this passage, again, this is his final week, he is saying, this is deceptive. And then he is talking to the deceivers. And then what he doesn't do is say, now, the multitude and disciples, you've heard about the deception and you've heard about what I'm going to do, but I'm not asking you to fix it. I'm not asking you to identify the deception and tackle it and defeat it. 
I'm not asking you to take your life and give your life to identifying everything that is wrong in the culture and make that your life goal and defeat it. I am not giving that responsibility to you. And yet so many of us, even as Christians, think, well, it is our responsibility. We need to correct it. I mean, we need to make this place a better place. We need to, we need to grab that which is wrong and, and, and say to people, two plus two is not five, and I'm going to give my life to de- defeating that principle. Let me just suggest this to you. If you've been spending the last number of years here looking at deception and saying that I'm going to give my life to defeating deception, you're barking up the wrong tree. The Lord has not called us to defeat deception. The Lord has called us in the middle of deception to present the truth of the gospel. And the truth of the gospel will always cut through even the worst of deception. The truth of the gospel will always defeat that which Satan is doing. Satan is already defeated. But what happens is if somehow the enemy can grab us and get us off the rails, and and if we can end up even as Christians spending our time over here trying to change government and change politics and change the economy and change this and change that and, and, and defeat this deception and defeat that deception, and we do all that, and we come to the end of life, and that's what we've spent our life doing, I hope that that doesn't happen to me because I'd like to come to the end of my life and have the Lord look at me and say, Ken, yeah, there was a lot of deception through your whole lifetime. But I'm so thrilled you used every minute you could to share the gospel with one more person. The gospel, you, you see, no law, no correction of deception, well, it, it, it is the goal The goal is to take a deceiving heart and share with a deceiving heart the truth of the gospel. And when that deceiving heart gets a heart transplant and regeneration takes place and they become a brand new person in Christ, then we're accomplishing something. Amen? Amen. Let's not get sidetracked. That doesn't mean, and don't leave here and say, Ken isn't concerned about sin. I am concerned about sin, but it is not our job to bring about some type of moral uh, uh, change. It is our job to, in the midst of this, this place that Satan's in control of, to present the gospel, and the gospel is powerful. You know how powerful the gospel is? More powerful than anything. It's more powerful than any weapon. It's more powerful than any explosion. It's more, par- it's more powerful than all, of the mo- all the money in the world. The truth of the gospel can perform a miracle where it can take a heart and reach inside the heart of a man and give that man a new heart, a heart that wants to do things God's way and knows that he's a sinner and needs Christ as his Savior. Amen? I'm so glad when the Lord is going through this passage or these two messages with the multitude and the disciples and also with uh, the enemy, those that are distractors, that he, you know, and I can just hear the multitude saying, ooh, boy, you know, he just pointed out this error. Well, you know what? We we better put together a committee, and, man, we need to to defeat that error. We, We need to get that done. In fact, you know, what we need is, is we need to somehow build an institution. Let's call it a church. We'll have an institution. And in that institution, what we'll do is we'll make sure that we've taken every one of these errors that we see, every one of these deceptions that, that we understand to be true there, and we're going to take every one of them and we're going to address them. And what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that as soon as we can, we're going to be an institution of people that come together that have all agreed that this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. And what we're going to do is then we're going to grab 
grab our church constitution and we're going to take every one of these deceptions and we're going to address it. No, this is what marriage is. We're going to take this in our constitution and address it and we say this is how God does it. We're going to take this in our constitution and do this. And what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite the Bible. We don't need to rewrite the Bible. What we need to do, because you see, our job is not to someday wake up and say, look around, look at this holy huddle. We've all identified all the deceptions. I read some other church's constitution here the other day, and goodness sakes, it was... I, I didn't know the size of it because I read it online, but it had to be that, you know, if it was pages, it had to be that deep in pages. And, and I got to laughing because as I was reading their constitution, I said um, to myself, oh, I know exactly what happened in their church then. And they, they, they wrote it into the constitution. That's what happened. And then this over here, that's exactly what happened. Oh, Yeah. In fact, we remember that what one day what happened was that there was a, a lady who walked in our church and she didn't know that we all as ladies wear dresses or skirts and she was wearing slacks. We better put that in our constitution. And are we listening? Pray for my wife. Aren't we silly people? Wow, we, you know, you've heard me, and I, I won't repeat this story, but I'll, I'm, surely I'll repeat some other stories before I'm done here, but you've all heard me tell the story about the, the wedding I was going to help out with, and it, all of a sudden, everything came to, it, it broke down because I didn't have a robe, and it was explained to me that it was a robe church. Well, oh, they need to put that in their constitution. <laughs> They're a robe church, a candle church, um, whatever. Isn't it crazy what we do? And the Lord has not called us to some type of behavioral modification. What he's called us to do is, one, recognize evil. And recognize the fact that we have been gifted as believers with the most wonderful privilege in the world, and that is to give an answer to the evil, Jesus Christ. And to present that, realizing that there is no greater strength or power in the entire universe that when an individual with a heart of sin hears, contemplates, gets in touch with the truth of the gospel, gets convicted, repents of their sin, agrees with God that they're a sinner, agrees with God that Jesus Christ was given in love by his Father to pay the price for our sin. He died in our place. He was our substitute, and he, tur and he offers every one of us salvation and the forgiveness of sin. And when a heart comes connected to that, and it registers and there's true repentance, a miracle happens that is the greatest, most powerful miracle that ever takes place in the universe. And that's our job. That's what we do. All right? Well, let's get to the Bible and walk down through it a little bit here and see what the Lord is doing. In chapter 23, then Jesus spoke to the multitudes, okay? He's preaching here. This is his last week. Chapter 23, verse 1, and he's preaching to his disciples, saying, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. And this is kind of sarcasm. He's saying they have put themselves in those seats. All right, so they have decided that they're the authority. And, of course, all the people knew that Moses spoke with real authority. So here you have these guys, and the Lord is saying, they're, they're sitting in the Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever he tells you to observe, that observe, do. Okay, so far it sounds like he's not being too hard here. What is he saying? He's saying that when they tell you something that Moses said, it's the gospel, it's truth, 
But then he goes on to take the whole rest of the section and say, but you know what? They don't live it. It's all just a bunch of talk. They don't live it out at all. So we look here, keep on going with me. He says, uh, for they don't, for they bind, well, they say, they say and they don't do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works that they do are to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries. Now, a phylactery was a, a little leather box. And the leather box that would be all made up and sewn together would be something that could hold Scripture passages. So they would make a little leather box, and they would shove Scripture in there, and then they would have some leather, uh, uh, whatever you call it. Help me out. What do you call it? What's that? Straps. Yeah, straps. Straps. Okay. Straps. Okay. I will forgive you. All right. So straps. And so you have this little box, leather box. And then you have these straps, and, and what you would do is you would put that leather box on your forehead, and then you would have that, you know, and, and, and what you're doing is you're signifying the fact that you've got the Word of God right here, in, in, you know, in, in your head, in your brain. Uh, or, or, and what you would do is you would, you, you would also wind this thing around your arms so that it would be close to your heart. And these phylacteries were, were made in such a way that people would look at the, at, at the scribes and the Pharisees and they would say, wow, you know, you, you got a phylactery. And they'd get them bigger and bigger. I can imagine, you know. Use your imagination for a minute. I'll bet some of these dudes really wanted to get attention, and they had a little leather box that covered their head. It was probably huge. Can hardly even stand up. Okay, so, so they got this going on. Now, now we're giggling. Why? Because isn't this silly? And, and it's all show. It's all just pretense. Uh, you know... Could it be that you and I will stand together and say, you know, I go to a church that believes in the whole Word of God. Could. But I've never read it. Could it be that we say, I go to a church that believes in the authenticity of Scripture and the verbal, verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture, and yet there are many, many days that go by that I never open the pages and live my life in the Word of God. But, 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 I, but that's what I stand for. I, I stand for the word, word of God. Now, the other thing is, these guys also would wear a robe. And on the bottom of these robes, and we'll read it here in a moment, there was some type of a fringe or some type of a, of a ribbon around the, the, the bottom of the robe. And that also signified their importance. These guys were important because they had a leather box, and they were important because they had this ribbon around their, the bottom of their robe. And they were important because when they would show up for a banquet, they would sit at the head table. They would make known that they were important. Uh, they, they would make known that they were important because when it came to prayer, they would pray loud enough and with big vocabulary that would be prayer vocabulary. And I will tell you this story, even though you've already heard it. A little boy went with his dad every Wednesday to a Wednesday prayer meeting. And every, every single Wednesday, he'd sit there, and the same deacon every Wednesday would say, Oh, dear Lord, uh, uh, please take the cobwebs out of my life. Please take the cobwebs out of my life. And the little boy heard that week after week after week. After he got a little bit older, he couldn't take it any longer. And the, old, the, the deacon got praying again, and the little boy jumped to his feet, and he said, Dear God, kill the spider. <laughs> All for show. Long prayers. Big words. Uh, and that's what they're doing here. Let's, let, let's look at it again. They bind heavy burdens hard to bear, lay them on men's shoulders, that they themselves will not... Uh, move with them with one of their fingers, but all their work they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketing marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Uh, 
important. You know, a couple months ago, I tried to get many of you to call me most holy Ken Dalton, but I couldn't get any of you to do it. But you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father. Wow. For one is your father. He is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, Jesus Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, naturally, I think that when the multitude and the disciples heard what I just read, some of them said, you know what? Yeah, we, we got to tackle this flactory thing. Let's, let's put an end to this. Uh, we got to tackle this thing of this ribbon around the bottom of the robe. We got to take care of that. And we need to really, this is deceiving, this thing of, of using these titles and wanting to sit at the head of the table. We are going to attack this, and boy, we are going to do our job because we see the deception. Uh-uh. The Lord's just telling them that that is the condition. In fact, the condition not only in religious circles in the temple, but the condition in Rome was awful. I mean, here people are being uh, roped to a, a telephone pole and set on fire in order to be lighting up the city for some type of special event. Here we're finding that, that somehow somebody with, I don't know whether it was science or met, I don't know where it comes from, but here we find that in pagan worship at this time, uh, around the time of Christ here, we find that people are taking their newborns you know, today we talk about abortion. They're taking their newborns, and what are they doing? They're burning them. You say, th- things have never been as bad as they are now. Well, I'll tell you what. When, when families are taking their newborns, and in order to worship a pagan god, they take the newborn and they burn the baby. And all you have left is the ashes of a baby in order to worship God. You tell me that this wasn't rough this is rough days. In fact, as we keep on reading here, we're going to see that, that Jesus Christ gets very um, dogmatic, and he says, these guys that are doing this kind of stuff are sending people to hell. And the word that he uses for hell is a title for the valley where they would put the ashes of the babies that they would burn. It was a valley that was a place of garbage. It was a, va- a valley that was a place of refuge. It was a valley that was a place of, of, of infants that are burned up to, to, to honor a, a pagan god. And, and he uses that same word in order to refer to hell. He says these that are leading people astray and, and talking about a righteousness that's a self-righteousness. I'm right with God because I'm so good. I've earned my way to heaven. I've done this. I've done that. And God is, he says, those that are preaching that are sending people to a valley of hell that is on the same basis as the place where they are burning babies and leaving them as ashes. Strong language. But the Lord does not tell them to change this. You know what he tells them to do? We can read it. It all wraps up as we come to the end of Matthew. You and I, we can go with the gospel. And in the midst of that type of a hellish culture, you and I can tell people, Jesus loves you. This I know. I know it. And he'll forgive you. He'll be your Savior. Wow. That was part of the final message that the Lord gives to the disciples and also to the multitude. Now, let's go on. Keep on walking down through this. We're only going to look at a couple more verses. He says, don't. Uh, he says, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And if you're like me, when I read that, my mind immediately goes to the Last Supper where the Lord's there and he's washing the feet of the disciples. Wow. 
the humility of our Lord and Savior. Verse 13, now what he does is he talks to the scribes, the Pharisees, and he calls them hypocrites. The word woe, W-O-E, is a strong word. The word woe is the idea of severe judgment. The word woe is a, is a word that, that reaches down inside of the, the very gut of the Lord and says, this is, make, th- this is upsetting me to my very core, what you guys are doing, and you're going to be judged. He's not telling the people to do the judging. He's going to do the judging. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Anybody, listen carefully here, anybody who uses, says, hey, uh, I, I believe in the Bible and I believe in Jesus and I just want to share with you that if you join a church, that'll help you get to heaven. They, the door of heaven is being shut with those words. If you get baptized, you will be ushered into heaven when you die. The door of heaven just got slammed shut. If you take the Holy Eucharist, uh, 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 some type of a, uh, and, and take Christ into your life, you, you will go, no, the door of heaven is slammed shut right then. Jesus Christ is saying, woe to you that are preaching a self-righteous righteousness because what you're doing is you are, not only are you incorrect, but you are teaching people something that is going to send them directly to hell. Strong language. His final message, that final week before he goes to the cross, the multitude's listening The disciples are listening, and boy, he's not pulling any punches. He says, anybody who is teaching a self-righteous salvation is sending people to hell. We can use all the terminology and say we're, we're Christians. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the cross. And then we can cross the line and begin to send people to hell when we say that if you obey the Ten Commandments, if you get baptized, if you take communion, if you do this, if you do that, if you get confer- if you do any of these things, and if you clean up your life and do all these things, surely the Lord's going to accept you, slamming the door of hell. When the Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, No man comes unto the Father but by me. There's nothing more insidious that the devil does in the area of deception than teach self-righteousness. Nothing. Nothing. Grace and more, it's grace, 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 unmerited favor. Shall we go on here and see what else he's saying in woes? Woe to scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves nor do... They're not going to be in heaven. They're not saved. Nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. There are some that are seeking, some that are asking, some that are inquisitive, and you're shutting the door. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. When he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Somebody comes to your door, they knock on your door, they say, hey, can I come in and talk to you a little bit? They come in and they begin to talk to you about the fact that Jesus really is not God. They begin to talk to you about uh, uh, a doctrine that is not a doctrine that we find within the Word of God. And they are doing all of this. They've ridden right up there to your house, knocked on your door, rung the doorbell, left their bikes out there in the front yard, and they've come in and you open up your house and they talk to you and you say, This is wonderful. It's not wonderful. They're shutting the door to heaven. 
They're trying to proselyte you to their insidious belief. Wow. And so we're not going to be real nice about it. When somebody comes to my door and they knock on my door and they say, can I come in? Can I talk to you for a few minutes? And can I explain to you that Jesus Christ is not God? Uh, That won't be nice either. I'll beg your pardon. Two plus two is four. Don't tell me it's five. Jesus Christ himself claims to be God. He is God. He is my God. He is my Savior. And we're not talking about things that are not very, we're talking about the very essence of our salvation. Well, that's what's happening here. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he's one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Let me look at my watch here. I need to move quickly. We're not going to turn to this passage. Well, I guess, um, David, you can put it up on the screen, but on your own, go back to Matthew chapter 13. And in Matthew chapter 13, you'll remember when we were there, we were looking at the parable of uh, uh, there and, and, and the problem of the tares growing up right alongside the wheat. And you remember the fact that the Lord uses that parable to explain the fact that the good seed of the Word of God, the good seed of the gospel is sown, and then the one who sows that seed sleeps, and during the middle of the night while he's sleeping, somebody comes along and sows tares right in the same field. You can read about it in chapter 13 of the book of Matthew. And the question that the disciples want is, well, should we go in there, and should we make it our life's goal in order to tear out all the tares. Should we get in there and tear out the tares, the ones that really are phony, the ones that really aren't Christians, the ones that really aren't saved, the ones that really aren't born again, so that we can become a holy huddle? Should we make it our life goal that we're going to become expert in everything and pull out everything that's tares so that's all that's left is the wheat? And when you read that parable, the Lord makes it clear, no. No, again, that's my job. No, you just keep sowing the seed. And when you sow seed, know that there's going to be tares that are also going to be sown at the same time. But don't worry about my job. Uh, I'll judge it. At the very end, I'll judge it. But you just keep on sowing. Keep on sowing and keep on sowing. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Keep on sowing, keep on sowing, and keep on sowing. Well, I want to make some application here, and then we'll wrap it up. I was, as I was on vacation, I was thinking about um, the conversation that we have and when people come to church, and uh, I think people sometimes they'll come in the church, and they'll say, hey, hi, how, you know, how was your week good? And, oh, man, can you believe the world is going crazy? Boy, it's just nuts. It's awful. Could you believe what we just what was just reported this last week? I mean, it's nuts. Can you believe what was just reported? I am so mad. I am so irate. I am so I am just beyond myself. I, I I'm ready to throw a shoe through the television. So we come together on Sunday morning and we share that with each other. I am so ticked with what's going on. We have got to put an end to this. We have got to defeat this. We've got to do something about this. Is that what we say? In our conversation with one another, do we look at each other and just say, this is nuts. This is so crazy. Or do we come in, walk in the door, and walk up to another person and say, hey, I'm glad to see you. I was thinking about you this week. In fact, I was praying for you because last week you were telling me about the three people that you're sharing your faith with. How's that coming? How you doing? How can I pray for you this week? 
How, how's it going? Wow. You, you know what unites a body of believers more than anything else in the world? is when that body of believers are all on the same page, and that page is all of us are trying to reach one more person for Christ. And we came to church because we wanted to get charged up to keep doing it. We came to church in order to, to, to learn how to lean on one another. That's why we're here. Wouldn't it be wonderful to, for everybody to sit down and, and to think to themselves that the person next to me, I know what they're trying to do. They are trying to share the gospel with somebody, and, and, and I want to be on their team. I want to help them. What if we came together and we said to each other, hey, uh, we're just thinking about your small group, and uh, how's it going? And uh, what are we asking? Is it getting bigger? What are we asking? You know, what are, what are we, how's your small group going? That lady, that man, that couple, that family that, that have been coming that still don't know the Lord, and how's it working? How do I pray for you? When you come up to Brett and to Riley, do you say, hey, how's it going? How many kids did you have? Sunday night. What was your attendance? Did you have any visitors? Or do you come up to Brett and say, Brett, remember that young man you told me that you've been witnessing to? How's it going? How's it going? Riley, you remember that young gal? Uh, how's it working? How do I pray with you? How do I partner with you? We're in this together. Do we ask each other on a regular basis, hey, uh, those five people that you have on your list, you know, because we all, right? Every one of us here have five people at least that are on our prayer list that we're trying to reach for Christ. How's your list of five doing? Who are they? If we're not doing that, guys, what are we doing? The Lord says, this is deception. And these guys over here are deceivers. And I'm going to take care of them. At the end, I will judge them. But that's not your worry. This world is full of deception. It is everywhere you look. It's awful. Babies are being murdered. It's deception. But don't focus on that. Don't lose sight of the fact that I have given you the keys to the kingdom. It's called the gospel. Go with it. What if we reminded ourselves all the time that our goal as a church is not to weed out sin, weed out immorality. Our job is not to separate ourselves from the world. We're not to love the world, but we're in the world. And we're to be a light, a shining, bright stellar light in the midst of deception. What if we took to heart the Great Commission? What if every one of us have a list, comes to us that fast, their relatives, their neighbors, their coworkers, their family, their friends, whom we love, and God has given us the privilege to share with them the greatest power in the world the power of being saved, the power of having a regeneration, regenerated heart, the power of becoming a new creation. Well, you know, when you go on vacation, you have a lot of time to think. And so you just got 
a fourth of my message. So there you go. <laughs> you know what? It's never too late. Never too late for any one of us to do a reboot and to remind ourselves that in the reboot, let's get back to what we've been called to do. If we've placed our faith in Christ, our job now is to share that with somebody else. And when they place their faith in Christ, let us teach them how to do that with somebody else. And when that happens, let them teach somebody else to do that. That's our job. That is a commission, a command from the Lord. Our job is to reach the lost. Amen? That's why we're a church. We come together to encourage one another. We're not here to become morally healthier. See, that's a fruit of a changed life. It first starts out with a changed life, a changed heart. I want you to be coming to me. And when you come to me and you say, Ken, uh, how was your week? Uh, I want to be able to say to you, it was a good week. I had this wonderful time uh, with this man who he's starting to see the truth of the gospel. It's a wonderful time. Nothing else is that important. Really. Our job is to reach the lost while we have time. Now, if you're here today, maybe you don't know the Lord yourself. Uh, I just, from the bottom of my heart, I want to reach out to you and just say, the most wonderful gift in the world is what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. He didn't say, clean up your life. He said, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. There's no greater rest than to know that we're right with God because we've been forgiven and his son is our savior. You've been in the church all your life. You've gone to Sunday school. You went to vacation Bible school. You've been to camp. And you have all the trappings. But do you know Jesus? Is he your savior? He can be. And today as we wrap it up, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed in a moment, between you and the Lord, you can get that settled. Jesus, I don't know a whole lot, but I do know I need to be forgiven. I need you in my life. I need you to be the Lord of my life. I believe that, Jesus, you died for me. And you can settle that this morning. Again, as I talk to believers here, check your spirit this week. Watch less cable TV and read more Bible. Watch less cable TV and pray more. And check yourself and check each other because we love one another. When all of a sudden we say, oh, this is nuts. This makes me so irritated. I am so mad. Let's get that out of our system. Let's love those that don't know Christ and love them to the cross. Please. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us that today things are rough and they've always been rough. Remind us, Lord, that when you are on planet Earth getting ready to go to the cross, you were dying on a cross out of love for frauds. You were dying on a cross for people who are egomaniacs. You were dying on a cross for people who are narcissists. You were dying on a cross 
for those who were all about power, mean, ugly, deceptive. And you died and paid the price for that sin. Lord, we want to be like you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Stay.